Well, uh, I'm aware that some of you weren't here last week, and so uh, then I realize it's been a long week, actually. Some of you were here, but you're like, what, what did we talk about last week? So uh, let me just try to do a very, very quick synopsis of it, and you'll, you'll find uh, we're going to, Genesis 6 is where you want to go there, so if you want to go to Genesis 6, and uh, let me just tell you what's been going on in this invisible war and I'm trying to take at least some of it chronologically so that it kind of makes sense to you. The first thing that happened, event number one, as you find those notes on the back of your prayer list, is, was the sin of Lucifer and his war against God in heaven. And we find this, and I didn't put it on the notes there, but you've got it in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You have a very real description of the sin of Lucifer, where he says, I will ascend to the throne. I will become like the Most High. I will, I will. It's me, it's my, it's mine. And we find that the first sin is the sin of pride. And that's identified for us in Scripture. We don't have to come up with that on our own. The Scripture tells us that it was by pride that Satan fell. I think he fell because he was the most beautiful of all creatures in the garden until God made Adam and Eve. And it's not that Adam and Eve were more beautiful than he was. His, his beauty is described in Ezekiel as just unmatched. But we were, we were breathed, mankind, we were breathed into by the breath of life. And so you and I, unlike any other creation, and certainly not, we're, we're not like a dog or a cat or an elk or a deer, we're, we're, and, we're, and we're not even like an angel, you and I are made in the image of God. We were stamped with deity. We were stamped with God-likeness. And, that was, and that's not true of the angels. And so in that moment... Lucifer realized what David the psalmist would write later, and he would say, Lord, you made us a little lower than the angels for now, but you're going to raise us above the angels. And the, the absolute proof of the commitment to God, to his creative design, was that he sent Jesus to die for angels? No. No, he did not. He sent, he sent Jesus to die for mountains and oceans? No. He sent Jesus to die for people because we are the culmination of his creation. And so that's what sparks this invisible war where we now have a devil who is fighting against God and the fight then becomes for mankind. So the the, the, the fight isn't for territory. Yeah, there's a whole bunch going to, there's going to be a fight for Jerusalem. But the fight is for people, okay? It's always for people. Well, we're coming to that time of year where uh, Halloween's right around the corner, right? Maybe your neighbors, like my neighbors, they got the whole front yard already made up. I don't, I don't quite get that myself, but uh, uh, that, it, Halloween's just like everything. And people, sometimes when we get up to Halloween, there's spookiness with it, and there's, there's ghosts, and there's mystery, and Christians will start asking me questions. And sometimes the question I get asked is like, well, can a house be haunted? And the, and the answer is Satan's not interested in houses. He's not a real estate agent. Sometimes we're like, we're like, well, what about this and what about that? L let me tell you what Satan is interested in. People. He wants to take every single person that he can to hell with him. He knows he's going to hell. He's, he's, read, he's read the end of the book just like you and I have. He knows that he's losing and he's going to hell. And the only way he can get back at God is to take the culmination of his creation with him. So that's what Satan's interested in. Now, can Satan, by his demons, scare the hoobies out of you? Oh, yeah, you bet he can. He can levitate tables. He can speak in other voices. He can make Linda Blair's head spin around, you know. Um, but 
his purpose isn't to scare you. In fact, I wish you understand how I'm going to say this. I wish that more people would get the hell scared out of them. And then they'd get saved, right? So, so the, the fight, the invisible warfare is for people. It's for souls. It's always been about that. So Satan's second attempt, or this first was the war in heaven, his second attempt is through uh, Adam and Eve. If he can get them to sin, then maybe they, they won't be redeemed. He doesn't know that God has a plan that Jesus would be slain before the foundation of the world. So he gets Adam and Eve to sin. And in chapter 3, verse 15, we have this prophecy that God would send a redeemer. So now he knows the redeemer is going to come. So he's got to thwart that. So he gets Cain to kill a- uh, Abel. So now Cain can't be the redeemer. He's a murderer. And Abel can't be the redeemer. He's dead. And, and, and so God gives Adam and Eve another child, Seth. And, and so all along the way, you, if you read your Bible correctly, you're seeing this invisible warfare, which brings us to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, a highly difficult passage to understand because of the nature of the language. It says in verse 2 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful or attractive, and they took as many wives as they chose. So what we did last week, which we are not going to redo, is we took the time to study how the phrase sons of God is used in the Old Testament, and we discovered in the Old Testament It's always used of angels. That's how it's always used. It's always used of angels. And so these sons of God are angels. Now we started to back that up with a New Testament study. Let me read these scriptures again to you. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're still kind of reviewing But I want to freshen your mind so that when we go forward, we're all together on one page. Now, the best way to do Bible study is whenever you can, you want the Bible to interpret the Bible. So you start to look for something that gives us some understanding about Genesis chapter 6. It's the days right before Noah. And you have this weird thing where the sons of God, angels, intermarry with women on earth and they produce, their, their, they produce children that are called the Nephilim or the Nephilim. And, and so where can we find some insight into that? We find it in 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to begin in verse 18. And I want you to see how this is connected to the gospel. For Christ also suffered once for sins. By the way, that's, his death was sufficient. He doesn't have to die and then die again and then die again and then die again. Once for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. He's the righteous. We're the unrighteous. You understand that. That he might bring us to God. This is God's plan of salvation. This is the one plan that Satan cannot thwart in the invisible warfare. Let's just stop here for a second. Let's just do this, make sure we're all together. So if my salvation depends on me, and I gotta, I gotta do good, and I gotta walk little old ladies across the street, and I gotta buy Girl Scout cookies, and I gotta go to church, and I gotta put something in the offering bag, and I gotta, I can't say very many bad words, and I gotta, and that's, and that's what your salvation's based on, then you're not gonna make it. You're not going to make it. And by the way, if that's what you're basing your salvation on, Satan doesn't even have to spend any time on you. He's already got you. He's got you thinking, I, if I will be good enough, I can get to heaven. That sounds a lot like the description of Satan in Isaiah 14. Paul says if you could do that, then you could boast. You could take pride into, I got myself to heaven. Because I, I overcame my potty mouth. Really? That's, that's going to be the base of your salvation? No. The base of your salvation is here. The Christ died for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh. He was made alive in the spirit. Now, Peter continues. And he says, in which, he's talking about the spirit of Jesus in which he, Jesus, went and he proclaimed to the spirits that are in prison. So there are some demons that are in prison. 
And this is, the, this is that word Tataris we talked about last week. And, and so when he goes to proclaim to them, he's not preaching salvation to them that if they would believe in him, they could be saved. He's declaring to them, you've lost, I've won. That, that's what's going on there. Now, where did these demons who were in prison come from? Verse 20. Because these demons, that's why they're, we're, we're, we're talking about the causality of why they're in prison, because they formally, uh, formally is a long time ago, did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Okay, so these demons who are in prison did something during the days of Noah. How patient was God during that time? 120 years from the time he told Noah to build an ark until the flood came. That's pretty patient. And, and, and so we have that, and he goes on and he says there, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, specifically eight, were brought safely through. Now, baptism, which corresponds to this, so what he's saying is the deluge of the old world by water, by the worldwide flood, is a picture of the baptism. That baptism then, and he's talking about not water baptism, but Holy Spirit baptism, now saves you, not because you have a removal of dirt from the body. It's not, it's not the actual physical water baptism that saves you, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Only God can do this work in you, then change you. And that can only happen, last phrase of verse 21, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is how he ends the chapter. Who, talking about Jesus, has gone into heaven. So the verse, verse 19 says, he went to the spirits in hell. Now it says he's gone into heaven. The Apostle Paul is going to reinforce this. We're not going to read it this morning, but in Ephesians 4, he says, how can he, first, how can he ascend if he doesn't first descend? So he goes to hell, then he goes to heaven. And he says, but he's now at the right hand of God. Now notice this. With angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him, forced subjection is how you read that. Now, we get angels. Well, who are authorities and powers? Well, they are also angelic beings, but they include the demons whom he declared to that were in prison. I've won. You've lost. You, you, don't, you can't do anything unless I let you because I'm the one who is the king of, of the world. And so Peter describes that. Now he's not done. Flip over to 2 Peter, find chapter 2. For me, it's just one page in my Bible. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're still looking for descriptions of the days of Noah, Genesis 6, and something about these sons of God that intermarried with these women. And so we begin reading in verse 4. If God did not spare angels when they sinned. Okay, so there's two times that we really know of when angels sinned, the war in heaven and Genesis 6. So which one is he talking about? If God didn't spare the angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell, that's the Greek word Tartarus. That's not your that's not everyday hell. That's a prison made just for angels. And he committed them into chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, okay, now we know exactly when the angel sinned. He's connected him for us here. This is during the days of Noah, who was a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6. And if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, ooh, wait a second, this is new information. Now we know, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have it in Genesis. We'll come to it in our time. But now he's connecting it to, in some way, shape, or form, the angels that sin. So he says that he turned Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. And he talks about rescuing Lot 
out of that. So the conclusion is verse 9. So the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. So sometimes when you do a Bible study like this, you go like, it's a great Bible study, Pastor, but where's the... Where's my everyday application that's going to get me through Wednesday? Well, here's one of them right here. God knows how to rescue the godly. Uh, he, he's actually really, really good at it. He does it all the time. He knows how to rescue the godly. Here's the flip side. And to keep the ungodly, the unrighteous, under punishment until the day of judgment. So when you look at somebody who's unrighteous and they seem like they're really getting away with everything... They're not. And God's got it. He's got all of it together. Now, I want you to keep turning the back of your Bible. Now we're getting to new territory that we did not look at last week. I want you to find Jude. Now, I've got on your paper Jude chapter 1, but there's only one chapter. So a lot of times when you see the nomenclature there, it'll just say, like, this could say just Jude 6 and 7, just the verses. But I've given you chapter 1 so you won't get mixed up. We're looking for more information about Genesis 6. We're, we're allowing the Bible to interpret the Bible. Now, right to this moment, I haven't even really made many conclusions. We're just soaking in the Scripture. What does the Bible have to say about it? And we find Jude. By the way, this Jude is a half-brother to Jesus and a full brother to James who writes the book of James. And so... This is what Jude writes, and we're going to begin in verse 6. And oh, let me begin in verse 5 so it has context. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt... Hey, let's just stop there just for a second. Look at the phrase. Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Now some of you, and you're really sweet to your pastor, you don't often come up and correct me or anything, but... Some of you have said, like, like when, I use, when I talk about Jesus in the Old Testament, you'll say, like, you mean God. And I'll be like, yeah, because that's who Jesus is. And you're like, you, 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 you treat me like I really don't, I don't really understand, like I'm a little kid and I just always call God Jesus. Well, the reason I do that is because it's in your Bible. So who brought Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt. You want to say, well, God did. You'd be correct. Yahweh did. You'd be correct. Jehovah. Yep, you'd be correct. Jesus. Well, he wasn't born yet. Well, that's just his physical birth. He always existed. He was always God. And here it is in your Bible. Jude, who grew up with Jesus, says, and uh, I want to remind you that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, he afterward destroyed those who did not believe. That's illustration number one. The people who were in the wilderness who never got to the promised land because of their unbelief. Illustration number two, verse six. And the angels. Okay, which angels are these? The angels who did not stay within their own place, their own domain, their own position of authority. Those angels, the angels who left the angelic spiritual domain, they left that and they, he goes on, they left their position of authority, they left their proper dwelling, they left the place that they were created to be. These, this is, these are like the exact words of Peter, these he kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Well, why would these angels who left their proper place, the place of their of spirit, the spirit world, the place of the authority, the place that they were created to be in, what did they do? How did that happen? Verse 7. Just as, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he's going to put, the, put these together for us, and it's going to complete our Bible study in this sense. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise, see that in your Bible? Just like that, this is what the angels did. They did something like Sodom and Gomorrah, indulged in sexual immorality, and they pursued, now here's a really hard Greek phrase. In my Bible, it's translated, they pursued unnatural desire. Maybe your Bible says they pursued strange flesh. 
They pursued something that was not spiritual, but flesh and fleshly and strange flesh. What is this strange flesh? It's the Nephilim. It's the Nephilim. They are the prodigy. They're the, they're the, they're the product of an angel that leaves his proper place in the spiritual world and, and, he, and he takes on flesh. Let's stop there for a second. Can angels do that? Yeah, they do it all the time in Scripture. All the time in Scripture, angels show up looking like men. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Jesus is about to ascend back to the throne of the Father. And it says, two men stood by in white apparel. And they said, why do you gaze at this Jesus who's going back? This same Jesus will come again one day. And Daniel says, and the, and the man Gabriel appeared to me. Oh, by the way, angels never appear as women. Did you know that? All the pictures, all the pretty pictures were little cheruby, girly angels. No. Angels never appear as women in the Bible, ever. I know Laura's an angel, but she's not in the Bible. Wow. You guys see how much marriage counseling I do during the week, that kind of stuff. So, so angels can do this. They're, they're, they're spiritual beings. They're spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, they have all kinds of powers. They have powers that you don't have. That's why right now, they're a little above us. We're a little below them. But it switches at glorification. At glorification, we go above them because we enter into the spirit world. When you get saved, justification, what part of you gets saved? Does your body get saved at justification? Uh -uh, I still got the same old body. And it's getting worser and worser. And it's not saved. It's not sanctified. What part of you got saved? It was your spirit. That's the part that's made in the image of God. That's the part that's stamped with the image of God. You and I are going to move one day into the spirit world. The angels moved from the spirit world. They left their proper domain. They left their places of authority to do what? This was the invisible war. They wanted to corrupt the DNA of humanity so that the Messiah couldn't be born because he couldn't be an angel. He'd have to be human. That's what they wanted to do. So they gave up their position of authority. They left that realm. They intermarried with women in order to accomplish that. And that's why Jesus destroys the world with a flood. Were the people in the days of Noah evil? Oh, certainly. More evil than today? Uh-uh. So you, you got to ask yourself the question, well, why doesn't he destroy us again? Why didn't he destroy, why didn't he destroy us at the Babylon stage or the Greek stage or the Roman stage? Why, not, why didn't he destroy us now? He could, could at least take San Francisco, right? We'd be okay with that. Oh, come on, that was pretty funny. Uh, why doesn't he do it? Because he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all that would come to redemption. But angels can't come to redemption. And if, the, if, the, those, that are, those, the, if those that are born to angel, then, then he's got to destroy the world. And what does he do with those angels. Because why, why then didn't Satan do it again? Why, why wouldn't he just, right, right after the flood, why wouldn't he send some angels to intermarry with women again? Because God apparently changed the rules. And now if you're an angel and you leave your domain, you go straight to Tartarus. You go straight to the prison God is not going to allow it anymore. 
My spirit will not always dwell with man in that respect. Let me show you a story that will help you. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Now, the work, and I've been telling you this in our Sunday morning study of the minor prophets, the work of the Old Testament, like Genesis chapter 6, is work. Because you've got to read a lot of scripture, and you've got you to look at it, and you've got to ask yourself, why does it say this? And then you've got to see if you can find another scripture that explains it. And sometimes they come in places where you don't really expect Luke chapter 8, I want you to find verse 26. Now, uh, this comes right after the story of Jesus being asleep in the boat, and uh, the disciples are in a storm, and the storm's so bad, the, the boat's starting to sink, and so they wake him up, and he says, peace, be still. And the storm stops. Would you like to have been in that boat? That's interesting. So he's just done that, right? And they ask themselves, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Verse 26. They sailed into the country of the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes. There's just a couple of ways to say this, but it's all the same place. It's opposite of Galilee. It's on the it's on the, what we would call the Gentile side of Galilee, okay? It's where the Gentiles live, some of the Samaritans. So when Jesus stepped out of the boat on the land at that moment, he hasn't even, like, he hasn't even got to town yet, the scripture says, there met him a man from the city who had demons, so let's stop here and talk about this a little bit. I'm not going not to dwell with it too much. We'll talk more about it later. So demons are not interested. I've just said this to you. They're not interested in haunted houses because houses don't go to hell. They don't go to heaven. But they're very interested in people. So people can be demon-possessed. Believers cannot be demon-possessed. Believers are already possessed by a spirit. You are possessed by the Holy Spirit. He, you belong to him. You are a belonging of his. So you are possessed by the Holy Spirit. Your soul doesn't have room for the Holy Spirit and a demon. The, the, Paul says the two, they, they, that can't work. So even if you are in sin, even if you're backslidden, you're still possessed by the Holy Spirit. But unbelievers who have never given their lives to Christ and who do not have the Holy Spirit, they can be possessed. So this man is possessed, and he is, the scripture says that he's possessed not by a demon, but look at your Bible, by demons plural. He had demons. Now we get a little backstory. Luke's going to give us a little backstory so we understand what we're about to read. For a long time, so we don't know, well, I don't know what a long time is, years. A long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. He appears to be a crazy homeless guy. But he's not just crazy in the head, he's possessed by demons. So this guy is living in the cemetery, doesn't live in a house, doesn't wear clothes. When he saw Jesus... He cried, he grunted, he shouted, he came out, and he fell down before him, and he says with a loud voice, this is not him speaking, this is the demons inside of him, what have you to do with me, Jesus, the son of the most high God? That's the, that's the statement of a demon. By the way, isn't it crazy that people, all the people in the United States can have great debates over who Jesus is, but in the invisible realm, everybody knows who Jesus is. He's the son of the most high God. And the demons are afraid. What? What have you? Why are you here? The demon continues. I beg you. Do not torment me. 
Jesus had commanded the unclean spirits, what is another name for a demon, to come out of the man. Luke gives us more backstory. Many times that demon, those demons, had seized him like a seizure. Uh, even when he was, even when the townspeople got tired of him and they kept him under guard and they bound him with chains and shackles, he would break the chains and shackles, the bonds, and be driven by the demon back out into the countryside, the desert, the wilderness. So now, for reasons of our own instruction, the Holy Spirit records this for us. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Now he's not talking to the man, he's talking to the demon. And the demon says, legion, for many demons had entered him. And the King James, for we are many. There's, there's more than one demon there. A whole bunch of demons. Uh, in another place, Jesus describes this. He goes, here's a guy who gets his life right. His life is a mess, right? So he, so his, he uses his, he uses his uh, illustration of a house. And so he shakes out the rug and he sweeps the floor and he cleans the house and he washes the windows, but he doesn't give his life to Christ. All he does is turn over a new leaf. So he turns over a new leaf, and now he's gotten rid of the demons. He's cleaned that out. The demon, Jesus says, goes and wanders around, find a place to live. And he can't find a place to live. And so he comes back, and he finds the house all swept and clean in order. So he moves back in, and he brings seven more demons worse than him with him. It's why turning over a new leaf doesn't work. It, it, it's why if you've got a friend and he's an alcoholic, yes, he needs to stop drinking. But if he stops drinking, that ain't going to get him to heaven. He needs Jesus. People, people die and go to hell sober every day. Do, are you, do you getting it? See, when you start to understand the spiritual realm, the physical realm starts to make sense to you. So he says, what's your name? Our name is Legion. We are many. And they, the demons, verse 31, they begged him not to command, they begged him not to command them because if he commands them, they have to do it. They know, they know they have to do whatever Jesus says. They begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Okay, so let's take the word abyss there just for a second. So here's what you have. You got all these words in your Bible. You got Hades, you got hell, you got Gehenna, you got Tartarus, you got a uh, bottomless pit, you got abyss. So here, the abyss, this, this Greek word, abuso, abyss, is used as a synonym for Tartarus. These demons in Luke 8, they know that there are some other demons from Genesis chapter 6 who are in Tartarus. They're in the abyss. They're locked up there. They can't get out. A demon spiritual creature doesn't want, the worst thing you can do with the spirit is lock it up. It, it doesn't, it does, they, don't, they, want, they don't want to lose their, their freedom and so they're begging Jesus, don't lock us in the abyss. Why would they say that? Because they know that there are demons that are locked up in the abyss. Not all the demons. In fact, probably not even a majority of the demons. But they know Jesus has the authority to send them there because he's already sent demons there. We read about it in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Jude. That's the description of what happened in Jude. Are in Genesis, and then for reasons that I don't understand, I can't explain this to you, they, they want to go into pigs. So a large herd of pigs were feeding on the hillside. I told you this was the Gentile section of town. And they begged him to let them enter the pigs. And your Bible says that Jesus gave them permission. So the demons came out of the man, and they entered the pigs, and the pigs rushed down a steep bank into the lake and they drowned themselves. The moral of the story is, 
It's better to be a dead pig than a demon-possessed pig. And when we get to heaven, we'll find out about these things. The pig watchers, the herdsmen, verse 34, they saw everything that happened. They fled. They told it in the city. And the people from the city, they went out to see what happened. And when they came to Jesus, here's the beautiful part of this story. They found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And instead of being thrilled, they were afraid. Okay, I've got some time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preach this. The unbelieving world is more afraid of Jesus and his love and mercy and compassion than they are demons. Do you see it? it? The guy used to break the chains and the shackles when they tried to restrain this guy. Whenever the local law enforcement found the guy and they go, we gotta chain this guy up, he's crazy. They were never, the Bible doesn't say they were ever afraid of him. They, they weren't afraid of the demonic. Maybe they were even drawn to the demonic. Maybe they're happy about the demonic. Maybe they got a whole bunch of stuff and they're going to celebrate the demonic Halloween. The, the world, the, our world, our culture actually is embracing Halloween more than Christmas. You, you, you speak of Christmas and somebody goes, well, that's hate speech. You're, you're talking about Christmas. You, you're making me, I don't feel safe with you talking about Christmas. Halloween, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want because the world, this is what the Bible says, the world lives in darkness. Jesus says in John chapter 8, in this heated discussion to the Israelites, you are of your father, the devil. That the world somehow is not afraid of Satan and his angels, but they are afraid of Jesus who loved them so much that he gave his life for them? Do you, do you see how the world is upside down, backwards, inside out, standing on its head? So, so the world's got different words for things than we do. We, we have a word murder, they have a word abortion. They have a word re, that reproductive rights. And when we use the word murder, it's, oh, he calls abortion murder. Oh, wow, what a terrible, oh, what a terrible person. It's all backwards. And the closer we get to the end times, the darker it gets. So here's the picture. Now, here's a beautiful part of this. There's, there's even more part of this that's beautiful. So they're afraid. So those who had seen it, they told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Instead of the people rejoicing, uh, all the people surrounding country of the Gerasenes, they asked Jesus to leave. We, we don't feel safe with you here. They asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So Jesus did. He left. He got in the boat, and he left. The man from whom the demons had gone, begged him that he could go with him. Have you ever begged Jesus for something? I mean, begged him for something? And he said no. This is one of those occasions. Jesus says no. Verse 39. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he, this guy's unnamed, we'll meet him in heaven, we'll find out his name. We just call him, by the way, if you read him in, in theology, he's called the Gadarene Demoniac. We don't have his name. He went away 
proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. About three chapters after this, and I don't think I have it marked in this particular Bible, Jesus goes back. And when he goes back, they all receive him. What was the difference? Jesus casts out demons. Oh, you got to leave. They were afraid. You got afraid. You got to leave. You got to leave. That doesn't, that doesn't fit my paradigm. That's not my worldview. You got to leave. I said, oh, I, oh, no, I can't. I don't feel safe. You got to leave. Jesus leaves one guy. It's the crazy homeless guy. He doesn't leave the, the dean of the Institute of Higher Learning to do this work. He leaves the crazy homeless naked guy and he becomes the evangelist. And we don't know how, we don't know how long it is. It's, it's not years because Jesus' whole ministry is three and a half years. It's months. And this guy is preaching, 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 preaching. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, you know who I used to be. This is what Jesus did for me. Jesus can do this for you. And when Jesus comes back, because of the preaching of one guy who is unnamed in history, they receive him. That's the beautiful part of this story. Now, I got to wrap up our Bible study. So go with me to Genesis chapter 5. Now, what I hope I've done with you today is I hope that I have proven to you from your Bible that the sons of God are angels. They are, they are not any old angels. They're fallen angels. They're, they're demons. And these demons have left their angelic uh, place to uh, procreate with women and their children are the Nephilim. And because of that, God brings a flood and he imprisons those demons so that they won't do this again and again and again and again. And so the, the rules are changed. But now you know why Genesis 5 is in your Bible. Now I'm not going to read Genesis 5, but verse 4 says the days of Adam... Verse 6 says, when Seth was 105 years old, he had Enosh. Verse 9 says, when Enosh had lived 90 years, he had Kenan. And verse 12 is about Kenan. And verse 15 is about Mahalel. And verse 18 is about Jared. And Jared, by the way, is the father of Enoch, who walked with God and was not. And we have that in verse 24, but Enoch is the father of Methuselah, Methuselah is the father of Lamech, and Lamech is the father of Noah. Why do you have this boring chapter in your Bible? So that you would know that this lineage from Adam to Noah is uncorrupted. There's no there's no demon in the line who spawned a Nephilim. That's why you have that. You have that so that you know when Jesus comes from the lineage of Adam to Noah all the way through, there's no Nephilim in that line. There's no corruption in that line. That's why Genesis 5 is important. Now, the angels in the abyss, do they stay there? I got just enough time to turn you to Revelation chapter 9. So Luke chapter 8 tells us, well, uh, Peter tells us, and then Jude tells us, these angels are locked into Taurus. They're, you can call it the bottomless pit. You can call it the abyss. Sometimes they are used separately. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. And we're going to find them here uh, with the phrase, the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter nine, we're in the middle of a description of the most terrible time ever that's going to be on the face of the earth. There are trumpets and seals and bowls of judgment that are poured out on God. And Revelation chapter nine, verse one says that this is the fifth trumpet. So the fifth angel blows his trumpet and a star falls from heaven to earth. Now remember, last week we talked about one of the names for an angel is a star. 
And so this is not just a star, this is an angel. So an angel is sent from heaven to earth and this angel is given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opens the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace so much that the sun and the air were darkened and polluted and, the, and they all came out of hell. It comes from the smoke of the shaft. So uh, you and I have read, starting in Genesis 6, all the way through, Peter and Jude, and in Luke 8, don't, oh Lord, Lord, don't send, us, don't send us to the abyss, don't send us to the bottomless pit. Okay, you can go into the pigs. But there are some in the bottomless pit. And now when we read about the wrath of God being poured out, we discover that these demons are going to be released. Here's how it goes, verse 3. Then from the smoke came locusts. Now this is metaphoric language. This is Greek language of apocalyptic language. Locusts on the earth. And they were given the power like the power of scorpions. He's seen a vision. He's trying to describe the vision. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only people and only the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Let's stop here just for a moment. There are going to be uh, millions and millions of people saved in the tribulation. They're going, to, they're, they're going to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. They're going to turn to him. And this is what the scripture clearly says. Revelation 7, John saw a vision. There were multitudes before the Lord who came out of the tribulation. So these are recognized as having the seal of God on their foreheads. But verse 5 says, They were allowed to torment everybody else for five months, but not to kill them. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, these days that are still coming, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Have you ever known someone who actually like really seriously tried to commit suicide and then didn't, couldn't? I remember years and years ago, Paul Harvey told the story of a man who jumped off the Empire State Building and he fell about three floors and the wind blew him back through the window and he came, you know, imagine working there on your, you know, you're on the hundredth floor and he comes through the window, he crashes in and he's just like, gets up and goes home. (laughs) I'm here to tell you, if it's not your number, it's, it's not, these people want to die, but they can't even find a way to die. Now, about these demons, here's another reason I believe they're demons. Look at this. In appearance, the locusts, they look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair was like a woman's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates, like the breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing to battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and they have the power to hurt people for five months, but not kill them. Now, I I read one time a guy said, this is a perfect description of Apache helicopter. Yeah, but Apache helicopter, he will kill you. That missile kills you. This, that's not what this is. These are demons. These are the demons who have, been, who have been kept for this day. Verse 11 says they had a king over them. Who's the king of the demons? They have a king over the angels of the bottomless pit. His, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In the Greek, it's Apollyon. The, the translation of both names is destroyer. It's the Satan. He's their king. He's the destroyer. This passage isn't done yet. Verse 13. The sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels. These once again are demons. These are fallen angels. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These are not bound in the bottomless pit, the abyss. These are bound somehow in a spiritual realm at the headwater 
of the Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for that hour, that day, that month, and that year. Does anybody here think that we're just going through history and God doesn't really know where we're going and we'll just so we'll haphazardly finally get to the coming? No, no, it's all, it's all down to every detail. These demons are prepared for that hour, day, month, year, and when they are released, remember the first demons? They can't kill anybody. They can sting you. They can hurt you. They can make you want to die. Now it's different. These, uh, these demons are released to kill a third of mankind. A third of mankind. Later, another fourth of mankind the scripture says, is going to die. So a third and a fourth is always a half when you add them together. So half of the population of the world is going to die during the tribulation. How bad is the tribulation going to be? It's going to be so bad that these demons who are the worst of the worst who have been in Tartarus, the bottomless pit, the abyss, since Genesis 6, and these other four, and I think the other four, I'm, okay, this is a guess, okay? Pure guess. I think the other four are the prince of Babylon, Greece, uh, Persia, and Rome. Remember Daniel chapter 9, he's fighting a demon, and the demon is the prince of Persia. And then the prince of Greece comes. So I think that's who they are. That's just my guess. But this is the wrath of God. Now, isn't it incredible that your Bible connects Genesis 6 to Revelation 9? And you know people who don't believe Genesis because they're evolutionists, and they don't believe Revelation because that's crazy apocalyptic literature. So if you just want to take the middle of it, you don't have any foundation to stand on. God who wrote the whole thing believes the whole thing and he, gave, he gives us the whole thing so that with a little bit of Bible study, you can go, oh my goodness, this all makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. 